Bonjour. Hello. Um, what I wanted to do is tell you a story before I started. Um, back in 2007, uh, after 15 years of working in the uh, very tense and intense financial markets, I decided to take a sabbatical. What I decided to do was to sail 4,000 miles from Western Australia to northern China in a racing yacht with 10 other boats. Why did I decide to do that? Well, I needed a break. But one of the things that really hit me, and hit me very hard, was the extreme change in climate from one part of the world to the other. In Australia, I was suffering 40 degrees, sweating, you know, barely could move for the heat. As we passed the equator, moved north into northern China and the North China Sea, the temperature plummeted to around minus 20, and my fingers were about to drop off. One thing I noticed from doing this exercise, from sailing, that was 4,000 miles, is that climate can be very extreme and that humans can adapt. We adapted, we left the hatch open, so the water poured down to cool us down. We put on extra layers and extra gloves to keep our hands warm when we were sailing through the cold. Humans can adapt. And that's what I wanted to talk about uh, this morning, is the adaptation to climate change, not just from the human perspective, but from the business perspective. If we think about the impact of climate change on the economy, it is tremendous. If we look at the US in 2013, somewhere in the region of $5.7 trillion worth of damage was caused by extreme weather events. That's 30% of GDP in that year. If we look at the EU in the same year, somewhere like $5.9 trillion of damage related to extreme weather events happened in 2013. That's about 35% of European GDP. The impact of climate change on the economy is significant. But what about business? What is clear, and from our research and many other people's research in the world of business and finance, is that the impact of extreme weather events in terms of both the frequency of events and also the severity is increasing at an exponential rate. If we look at the uh, frequency of events in terms of the damage caused, uh, the insurers and the reinsurers uh, have suffered on an annual basis somewhere in the region of $135 billion back in 2012-2013. And around 95% of the damage of, uh, caused by these weather events uh, is actually weather-related or extreme weather-related. The severity is also increasing. So not only are we seeing more extreme weather events, but we're also seeing the severity in terms of the actual damage caused as increasing considerably. And the same goes uh, in terms of we look at the business side. Uh, on an annual basis, uh, businesses are, based, are claiming around $35 billion of losses from extreme weather. So this is a, a trend which is increasing as climate change impacts more and more, not just the economy, but the impact that, the, uh, that business has to suffer as a result of extreme weather events. So what does that mean in the terms of the world of, uh, of credit ratings? Now, some of you may not be familiar with credit ratings, so I'll just say briefly what it's all about. Essentially, a credit rating is an opinion uh, on the likelihood of a company or a country to default on its debt obligations. In other words, if it owes money in the form of a bond or in the form of a loan, and it doesn't pay back an interest or principal payment uh, on the due date, that's considered a default. So what we measure at Standard & Poor's is the likelihood or the probability of a default occurring. Now, why is that important? Well, basically, insurance companies, institutional investors, and banks, the whole financial system relies on measuring credit quality in order to assess how much of its capital is at risk. Uh, and that determines the rate of return uh, that it demands from its investments, and in fact, it determines where capital is allocated in the global economy. So that's why credit ratings play an important role within the financial system. Now, when we look at the risks that affect credit, one of the ones that we've noticed over the past few years we have been much more pervasive is climate risk. Uh, and climate risk is often expressed in the forms of natural disasters or natural catastrophes. 
Uh, we did a study on, in terms of how much natural catastrophe has impacted business ratings or corporate ratings over the past 10 years. So out of 6,000 uh, rating actions, or you know, that's basically a, an upgrade or a downgrade in one of our ratings, we noticed about 1% over the past 10 years was directly related to a natural catastrophe or uh, an extreme weather event. Now, that sounds like a low number, yeah, 1%. But what we noticed also was the increasing trend. And as climate change has a greater impact on weather-related patterns, that 1% we know will increase. If we look at countries, we've done a recent simulation on sovereign ratings, and we've simulated what the impact of climate change is going to be over the next 20 or so years, and we noticed that in a, an extreme weather event, that's one in 250 years, you will see a two-notch downgrade in some of the sovereigns. So that's quite a, 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 quite a meaningful impact uh, over the coming years in terms of severity of the downgrade due to climate change. I won't go into all the detail in terms of how we have to assess this risk, but what we wanted to do is look at it in terms of the key components of credit ratings. It's one side is financial and the other side is business. Uh, this chart up here shows you the financial uh, parameters that need to be addressed, both from the balance sheet on the left-hand side, looking at the asset side, uh, but also looking at the uh, profit and loss and cash flow in terms of profitability uh, and other items that we look at. What we've noticed in terms of our research is that climate risk pervades right across the profit and loss, the balance sheet, and the cash flow statement in terms of how it can impact in terms of disruption to profitability, interruption to cash flow, and devaluation of assets. But what's probably more important is how exactly do we assess this risk in terms of our ratings? And what we've done uh, since uh, 2013 is redesign our methodology to incorporate a number of risks. And some of those risks are very much related to environment and climate risk. We've, in the process of reviewing exactly how that's done, uh, we have about 100 references in our methodology to environment and climate risk at present. Uh, those references relate to things like weather, to emissions, to regulation, to natural disaster, all sorts of elements which we would typically uh, refer to in terms of the impact of climate and environmental risk. But one thing is looking at the reference. The other thing is seeing how that actually translates in terms of a change in the rating. So out of those 100 or so references, we did a search and looked at, over the past two years, how many uh, corporations have been impacted by environmental and climate risk. And bear in mind that we have over 3,000 ratings and corporations around the world. Now, what we've discovered is around 300 cases of ratings changing in the past two years because of those uh, issues. So if I just give you a couple of examples here. Uh, Teneco. This is a car parts manufacturing company in the US. Now, one thing I wanted to stress is that climate risk can be both positive and negative. There's both winners and losers here, and I'll come to the positive side later on. But Teneco is a good example of some, some uh, positivity coming out of this because it's a company that's adapted and uh, actually uh, profited from all the new regulations coming in to make companies more environmentally friendly. This is a company that makes um, clean air converters for cars, and as regulation in the US has forced uh, more tight emission controls on vehicles, uh, Teneco has actually profited from that, and that led to an upgrade in its rating to double B plus about a year ago. However, most examples in the corporate world are negative. Uh, Genon, which is an independent power producer, again in the US, uh, that uh, company was downgraded to double B minus from double B again about a year ago and the principal cause for that downgrade was the introduction of new clean air regulations specifically impacting nitrogen oxide uh, limits so uh, because of those new regulations this company had to install equipment to reduce emissions uh, the cost of installation was going to mean that it became unprofitable uh, bearing in mind the cost of power and the, the contracts that it had, and that led us to downgrade the rating. There are numerous more examples like this, uh, which we found over the past two years. And what's for sure 
is that going forward, there will be plenty more. So that's um, the risk side of it. One thing I wanted to finish up with is just to explain a little bit about the opportunity and how the markets have adapted to try to change the economy and indeed the financial system towards a more sustainable and low carbon future. Um, and one thing that really typifies this is the, the green bond market. Now, bonds are financial instruments which are uh, used by corporates and, and, co and countries to raise money from, uh, from investors. Um, if you look at the uh, international uh, fixed income market with the bond market, it's somewhere in the region of $93 trillion. It's a huge market. Uh, and this is all the money that's floating around the world between big insurers and institutions and, and corporates and, and, and countries. The green bond market is relatively new in terms of corporates. It started about two years ago. Essentially what it is, is when a company wants to raise money in the bond market and allocate that money to an environmental or sustainable investment, it does so under the framework of a green bond. What it means is that when that company receives the money from the investor, that money is allocated to a green investment, like a renewable energy project, energy efficiency, whatever it may be, uh, it's got to be certified as green, and then there is a, 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 um, a standard which leads to investors being interested. Now, that market has grown considerably up to the point where, in 2014, we're seeing nearly $40 uh, billion dollars, uh, of issuance of green bonds, um, and we expect that to increase considerably going forward. Now, what's driving this increase? Well, basically, investor demand. Investors are asking more and more for um, opportunities to put their money into green investments because they have responsible investment mandates, because they see the sense of sustainable finance, and also because most of these investments are in the world of infrastructure. Uh, and infrastructure has massive investment requirements somewhere in the region of $1 trillion per annum, according to World Economic Forum. So if you think about that $1 trillion per annum, most of that needs to be sustainable. The green bond market and green bond issuance is a vital solution to solving this problem. So I think there is great opportunity, great optimism in terms of green finance, and a stand and pause, we hope that we can help by assessing the risk and helping the financial system adapt to what's needed to transition to a low-carbon economy. Thank you.